Namaskar, I'm Professor Devdeep Purkayasta from the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. Welcome to my course, Business Fundamental for Entrepreneurs, Part 1, Internal Operations. As part of the course, I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Umakan Jairam, who is a very illustrious finance industry veteran to share a few modules. Professor Umakant is an alum of IIT Bombay, and he went on to do his MBA, post which he has 30 years plus of industry experience in various aspects of finance. He has worked extensively in the banking industry, he has founded his own company, he has sold his own company, and he serves now as a public interest board member at the Bombay Stock Exchange. So it is my pleasure to hand over to Professor Umakant for his module. <clears throat> we now move on to uh, focusing on finance. I would like to begin with uh, reminding all our viewers uh, on the core axioms of finance, as well as I'll take some time to actually explain as to how finance is different from accounting. And finally, it's important for founders to know what part of finance is actually most important for them to be fully aware of and what part of finance should necessarily be delegated to a CFO. So in this slide, we are basically looking at all these three aspects. How is finance different from accounting? First of all, the focus of finance is not to actually depict the true and fair value picture of what has happened in the business. The focus is forward looking and it is for decision making for the managers. It is also for decision making for the investors. It could also be a decision making for creditors or in lenders. In either one of these forms, finance basically is a bunch of, is a view that is taken on the business using some tools on helping their decisions to be made. So typical decisions for managers is how much should I actually leverage debt into my business? What is the right level of debt? <clears throat> Second is, how much can I grow? What should be my growth ambition? Third is, what should be my target profitability if I have to satisfy? all my stakeholders, and at the same time, be able to sustain the growth. For the investor, the most obvious one is, should I invest more or should I disinvest in this business? To answer that question, you should know what is the value of this business in the views of the investor, the shareholder value. What is the outlook for shareholder value in the near future? For lenders, they want to know if the amount that they are lent to the business is going to get repaid on time and in full. So this is the kind of decisions that they're concerned with. And the tools that finance allows all their users are the ones of forecasting because it's forward information, are the ones of building scenarios because 
the future is not known and you have to build make some assumptions about you know the external market about interest rates about inflation or supply demand and so on about the riskiness of cash flows and profits and revenues and ultimately about valuations or the worth of the business this is a focus of finance which is not necessarily the same focus of accounting having said that what are the basic principles what are the axioms of finance what are the tenets or the key principles on which our financial knowledge is derived the first one the most universal one is time value of money the fact that a rupee or dollar received today is worth more than if it is received in future is well known in fact present value of a rupee is always could be in nominal terms lo- lower than the fo- future value as long as interest rates are positive this is the first universal principle it's intuitive and people really are aware of this the entire world of investments as well as the world of finance rest on applying derived principles from time value of money you will see further on how businesses are valued using what is known as a discounted cash flow and discounted cash flow is also a late, later application of time value of money the second principle is that of risk and it says that no incremental risk will be taken by anyone unless there is an expectation of commensurate return this is the basis on which asset pricing models are based assets are priced because they 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 actually generate cash flows and each of those cash flow profiles have different risks attached to them risk is defined as the variability in the cash flow and even the uncertainty of such a cash flow being really received anything adverse is considered to be a risk given a particular risky cash flow which has been factored into an investment decision investors will expect to relate to any future information on that level of risk and if there is going to be more risk in the new information flowing through their expectations on returns will be upsized even more the general theorem here is risk follows return as risk increases returns also expected returns also grow and this is the relationship in risk and return the third principle of finance is that cash and not profit or accounting terms is key when you are actually evaluating a business whether you should invest or not it is not the net income that matters as much as the cash flow because values of the assets the bundle of assets is what a business comprises is nothing but the sum of the present value of cash flows generated over time the other business uh, axiom is slightly counterintuitive this is not something that we really encounter with in our daily life in business it's only incremental cash flows that counts if cash is not generated incrementally then it's getting used somewhere else it is incremental cash flow that gen- it generates a value uh, from time to time <clears throat> the next one is about risk and it says that all risks are not equal what do you mean by that certain risks have got the potential for getting hedged out or managing out give an example if you have revenue risk arising from the sales to a particular type of customer or a sales of a particular type of product let's say that you are in the business of selling umbrellas 
the risk of umbrellas being sold when there is going to be no rain or a poor monsoon is something that can be actually diversified or hedged out if you add another product which basically has a higher revenue outcome in precisely the same conditions suppose there is no rain and but there is sunshine and if you were actually selling sunglasses as well then when the sunglasses unit is not making money you're probably making money out of umbrellas and when the umbrellas is not making money you're probably making money out of sunglasses and this is an example of hedging of risk or diversifying risk the statement being made here is some risk can be diversified such that the concentration of revenue here is being diversified whereas some risk just cannot be diversified and they are systemic in nature or systematic in nature these risks are global macro risks right now a lot of talk is being made of what how the global macros is impacting business worldwide geopolitical tensions or war is one example where you know business activity all around is subdued this is not diversifiable the last but most counterintuitive principle of finance is the curse of competitive markets they say competition is the best thing that could have when understood will allow you to win um, and your business plan can be a winning business plan if it knows how to beat competition that's right but when you win you actually show that you will be having making profits under a particular condition and your profit making potential becomes the real goal goal of new entrants others will also come in with the prospect of making profit such as yourself and as a result over a period of time the profit potential of your business will actually get subdued so the price that innovation has to actually recover all of the cost of innovation in time before the business gets commoditized and before the business basically encounters a competitive intensity where profit pools are actually going to shrink this is what the curse means it works the other way around as well when the prospects of an industry is actually falling what really will happen is the the least profitable will exit the business and then the next least profitable will, will also exit the business and then everybody else from below and as more exits take place the competitive intensity in that business is actually reduced and the profit pools of the in, of the remaining incumbents actually increase so competition works on both ways it tends to actually subdue the profitable at the initial stages and it also tends to enhance the remnants when consolidation takes place and that's the principle that is being mentioned here these are the ones, some of the main axioms of finance which we should always be aware of surely business owners should be aware of all this because they can then interpret the decisions which are recommended by the cfos or by they themselves can suggest the right type of decisions to be made given a particular situation based on their understanding of these axioms the final point that we need to know is how much of this should the founders completely be fully aware of the early startup stage at least unit cost economics is something that the founder needs to be aware of it allows him to analyze operating revenue operating expenses and take decisions that drive the business towards profitability at the soonest it allows him to optimize his optimize his expenditure and actually make you know value accretive decisions risk management is the other area which as the business scales up a founder should be more and more aware 
this comes from the principle of all risks not being equal, to diversify, to actually avoid revenue concentration, to de-risk something called operating leverage. Operating leverage is nothing but the proportion of the total cost which is actually fixed in nature. When this ratio is very high, it happens to be that the sensitivity of operating profits to, which is a bit duh, to changes in sales is far more acute. And one has to de-risk this by actually taking several different strategic decisions in such a way that you actually reduce the fixed cost percentage of total cost. Outsourcing is one such decision. De-risking financial leverage is basically bringing down the leverage or the debt to equity ratio of a business. The debt to equity ratio being high basically puts a stress on meeting the obligations and borrowings during times which are difficult, in down times. And it is the actual sensitivity of interest paying potential to actual profits. These three are the main areas that owners need to actually decide on as the business turns around and is in the growth mode and definitely more compelling so, compellingly uh, more so when uh, the businesses are scaled up. Finally, some aspects of the financial planning should come straight from the top. When you're an early stage company, cash flows, forecasting cash flows is all about how much of a tight leash you can put on and controls you can put on expenditures. This has to be coming from the top. Also, how can you derive revenues faster and cash fast for, from the revenues? By taking decisions on credits to the customers, discounts to the customers, by selling down accounts receivables. These are all the various means that you can use to actually increase your cash flow profile. The ability to build scenarios is very related to risk management. Scenario planning is a top management skill that needs to be uh, learned because responses to these scenarios or decisions under certain scenarios are what will make you win. Factoring riskiness into the cash flow profiles or decisions that you take is an art that you will actually learn through planning and through the results after the planning. And of course, uh, you get better and better in terms of presenting plans to investors which are credible, which actually make you credible in the eyes of investors because of how you communicate the future and the financials in a predictable manner through guidelines that more or less get actualized over time. This is what we would say is a founder's learning you know, journey in the areas of finance. He should not confuse himself with all the things that the CFO needs to do, but he should definitely own up on these or three, two or three main things. That said, let's just look at, you know, the true or main areas of financial planning in the early stage and the of the business. The question being asked here is why should founders be involved with planning? The reason why founders have been asking these questions is because they see a lot of challenge in the entire planning process. First of all, making a plan, estimating numbers is not an accurate process. No one can actually be able to accurate cost and expenses, I mean estimate cost and expenses accurately at all times. So there's a level of, you know, ambiguity there, there's a level of error that's built into the process. So why should I do something that is inherently inaccurate? The second reason why founders challenge the planning process 
is especially early startup founders is that uh, you know venture capitalists and those investors who they talk to uh, in the early stage seldom take their plans at face value they seldom accept them they sometimes read them but you know they don't seem to pay much attention to the plans per se this is a fact the third reason why founders find it difficult to spend time on planning is because they got other things to do which seems to be more important like meet the next customer or make those new alliance with a partner or to actually manage employees or to actually develop uh, the product itself this is the areas that they are more comfortable with and they don't see the immediate bang for buck in terms of setting down and scrounging all kinds of numbers to actually come up with a business plan the last one is eventually all plans look like the same that's true because all all that you see from startups is nothing but this figure holistic curve so if everything remains more or less the same and you're hitting at the same why do them all we need to do is tell them as to what goes behind the plan these are all valid arguments but the main purpose of planning is not to see that as an end in itself the plan itself does not actually derive any benefit on its own but it's a means it's a means of clarifying the assumptions that you have on your business approach you take towards various issues on generating revenue on making expenditures the kind of compromises and trade offs that you will make and the kind of you know product that you're going to want to build that whether it's going to be a costly one or it's going to be the one that is acceptable to valuable to to your customers but you know at very low cost and so on and so forth it's also a means to build credibility that you have thought through the situation you looked at you know a conservative if not a um if not a realistic view of what the outlook could be it's very easy for a founder to be very because he's passionate about his product to be actually blindsided of the outcomes and to actually overstate and overestimate the success of his business a credible owner is the one who actually leaves enough room for outcomes that may not be as bright as he may think it be in fact most owners and investors deal with the future with certain amount of risk to them risk is the ability to afford adverse outcomes afford losses and this is the level of losses that they can afford if the owner and the investor both agree on common assumptions including this assumption is the level of loss that you can actually afford for a given point of time it makes things a mo- lot more easier we are in the same path of com- of uh, progress towards a profitable outcome and which is what they are all looking for the final goal is to reach here where you are actually going to succeed in the marketplace and be extremely profitable so planning is not to be seen as an end in itself but more as a means to build credibility agree on common assumptions and communicate effectively on how the business is going to grow and, and what path it is going to take towards profitability it's important here to know that planning is more for the owner's use itself for setting internal performance goals and setting goals for himself the secondary use is to share the plan with a given context and a goal with an audience in mind this sharing process is different based on which stage of business your startup is in if your startup is in the pre revenue stage 
all you want to be talking about from a finance perspective is cash flow projection. How will I manage cash flow? How will I generate it well? What, how will I manage my burn rate? What is the kind of runway that you, I will be having and how do I manage when my runway becomes thinner and thinner? What is the number of months I actually have before I raise my next round and how many rounds have I raised with adequate time in hand? And what's the history that I have? This is what is the context of pre-revenue business. And here the objective has always been on product development, MVP, product market fit, and getting the first customers or beta. In this entire journey, cash is being burned. And if you are, in, you are able to actually present us a good history of having adequate cash to meet all the objectives and having met all those objectives in the first two, three, four, five challenging stages, it's quite likely that you can actually move forward very comfortably. That's the context for the first. Early revenue is taking off on the first. It's about revenue forecasting. You got your first few clients. How much can you actually keep growing and getting revenue from those clients? We use that for recurring revenue, MRR or ARR, number of customers won, then lifetime value of the customers, customer acquisition cost, and all of that. It's only when you actually get into early growth, which is you're actually looking at somewhere here where you're very, very close to turning around. And then from now on, you can either take a trajectory which is steep like this, or you can go like this. That time, you need to start looking at high-level budgets, top-down budgets based on how much can you seize from the market, how quickly can you get more customers on board, how quickly can you grow your revenues, how much can you control your cost, how much can you actually get onto an engine of being operating margin positive and sustainable growth. Sustainable growth is further growth comes from internal cash generation and not from external cash generation. If you actually overcome this challenge as well and reach till here, you become a stable business. You now actually have to, you're no longer a single owner or few owners founded based company. You become a decentralized business. You probably have a management structure in place. You probably have a board of directors in place. You have a formal process of operational planning, which is basically a revenue plan, an expenditure plan, a capex plan an expenses plan, R&D plan, and so on and so forth. New products introduction. All of that is done by different age, different parts of the organization, by different owners on the plan, and they get consolidated and presented to a senior membership board. The whole context of planning and finance changes once you become a high growth company and once you become a company of scale. The most mature stage of planning comes in when you use dynamic planning, that is scenario-based approaches, what if, sense and response, roll forward planning, so on and so forth. This happens when your business is really taken off. But for early startups, we just need to understand the context of cash flow management, of revenue growth management, and of a high level budget. And if you meet these three stages pretty well, then you know that your business is in good shape. Having said that, let's take a good look at how to do a top-down plan. What are the ways in which you actually look at it? The first ones are very easy, and we talked about it before. We ought to have a tight knit and a good view on, on cash flow management. The second one is about revenue sales funnel. It starts from, a top-down approach starts from estimating of market size. We have the term called serviceable operating market. And to look at your potential to actually win market share from competition. And how you will grow from a particular base case of market share to a future state. 
and establishing the revenue growth that's going to come out of this process. This is a top-down approach. The bottom-up approach is looking at the assets and the business that you have right now and the track record. What did you do last year? What is the incremental increase in resources that you can apply to your activity this year? And how much can you stretch walk forward basis? You can actually look at the trend of customer acquisition costs that you are actually incurring and whether the, your targets that you can reasonably achieve will be based and determined by your CAC. How much resources can you raise to further acquire an additional bunch of new clients? You can look at the conversion ratio of new prospects to clients. You can determine your budget finally. CAC will give you the budget to over client and the conversion rate will give you the budget for all prospects. And finally, you can project the customer growth. So doing this, both the exercise of top down and bottom up and right sizing, you start from there, go down and then reiterate going up. It's, it is the way in which revenue budgets are finalized. It's also called the sales funnel approach. When it comes to cost, it's important to actually understand um, the, way, the basic types of costs that you have in a business. You have costs which can be defined as either one time or recurring. A one time cost is a sunk cost and a recurring cost is repetitive in nature. Advertising can be a repetitive cost. A one time cost can be you know, a trans digital transformation or setting up servers and so on. It can be also classified as essential cost and optional cost. What is nice to have and what is a must have in terms of resources. It can be actually classified as fixed and variable and we saw that before. Fixed costs are those that have to be will be incurred no matter how much volume of output is actually realized by the firm. And variable cost directly you know, changes with the level of output. The second thing about cost is not all costs are expenses. Expenses, cost can be booked as expenses when you get a tax break. Such expenses will reduce your taxable income. Otherwise, they are non-allowable expenses which will actually drain down your profitability. But certain costs can also be booked as assets. I'll give you an example of a cost that can be booked as an asset. Suppose you hire 20 developmental engineers to actually build a transaction system that uses AI and content management outputs to actually make recommendations. This whole project, which may be about say 200 man years, can be budgeted for a particular level value, say 10 lakhs or 20 lakhs, and can be expended out in the year as an expense. In certain cases, this can be capitalized and amortized over the many years of benefits that such a content management system will give to the business. If you capitalize it, it becomes an asset which gets amortized. And if you expand it, it becomes an expense. That said, Research shows that for a typical tech startup, especially from India, which are all consumer startups with services concepts, the startup cost breakdown is as follows. 25 rupees to 100 is actually spent on application development. 
either a website or an app that is a mobile app 25 to 100 equal amount is spent on payroll 15 13 rupees to 100 is spent on advertising and uh, amongst all the businesses that are probably mixed between uh, products businesses as well as services business the level of inventories to your cost structure is about 11 rupees to one the rest of all gets distributed between rent utilities equipment supplies consultants market research and insurance in other words the main cost items for setups are tech startup expenses marketing expenses office space expenses payrolls to you have to pay professional services and you can optimize this a lot and other expenses this is again so if you have to look at dimension of nice to have this can be a nice to have this can be a nice to have the rest of payroll is must office space is probably must or maybe nice to have also in current context marketing is must and tech is must you can take the choice as to uh, whether you want to actually upfront them by in terms of one time or you want to take it as a recurring expense and also in terms of expenditure whether you want to book it as an expense or you want to book it as an asset but having taken those choices you pretty much get what your initial setup expenses is afterwards you have to actually take benefit of the unit cost economics to look at how your income statement will look in terms of unit revenue unit cost variable unit cost fixed which comes from here and the operating profits you probably will come to something like this your revenue model for a business if it is coming from sale of products sale of services sale of people that is billable people or billable people output and subscriptions then you can actually make estimates on an operating basis which gets translated into revenue lines or the top four revenue lines for three years this will constitute your total revenue forecast the forecast is will have to be sensed in terms of a sense check in terms of growth whether such a growth is really achievable in this case 38 percent and 47 percent growth this question can only be answered in the context of which industry segment you are in what is the state of the industry what are others doing are you replacing is there a real compelling reason why your business is going to succeed while others don't and so on what is the level of innovation that you have what's the compelling proposition that you have in your business direct expenses are the ones that we defined which are directly attributable to the output and comes as cost of goods sold or cost of sales in this particular business which is an exchange offering in the financial markets this happens to be very 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 low the contribution margins are very high gross margins and contribution margins are very high and as a result of which this business is sure to succeed in fact it's unheard of in the common place to have such high margins maybe only microsoft seems to have such margins but if you have a prospective balance or income statement like this you're surely going to be a unicorn if you have to look at it in in the real context you see that there are some below the line items you see that there are things like other variable cost which are not accounted for in the direct expenses so it is prudent for you to add them back and maybe then your margins will come down but in this case it comes down only marginally in this case it will probably come down to about 50% which is still a very good prospect but once you actually did it you can actually start looking at different scenarios what if such variable cost increase by 10% what if total revenues fall by 10% or to 20% what if both happen at the same time can build scenarios and ask a lot of what if questions and then come up with different versions of your income forecast 
you can put in weights for each of these versions based on what is the more probable odds that such a situation will happen. And then you come up with what is known as a sensitivity analysis and expectation value for both revenues, expenses and operating income. This is the level of analysis that you would like to do when you are actually forecasting your business forward. As you would notice, all of this are in terms which are accounting terms. Revenue is an accounting term. Expenses is also an accounting term, even more so because it's not equal to cash. Certain expenses like depreciation is non-cash. So accruals change the cash profile of, a business, of a, the expense. Prepaid and um, items also change the cash profile of expenses. So these are accounting forecast. We have to convert this accounting forecast into cash flow forecast. Uh, because of our understanding of cash flow statements, this can be done pretty easily. All that we are doing is take our line of operating profits, add back the non-cash expenses such as depreciation and amortization, and reduce tax because ta tax has to be paid as a cash tax. Keep a reserve for non-discretionary capital expenditure that your business will always have to incur in order to remain alive. And keep another reserve for changes in net working capital, current assets minus current liabilities, the level of working investments that your business needs. And then you arrive at a level called the free cash flows. This is the free cash flows that the business can reasonably expect it to generate without taking into account any external debt because you've taken out all of the debt effects on the business. And this free cash flow profile is what is determined, will determine the value of the business. Such key cash flow streams are now discounted using the time value of money. Time value of money is nothing but the present value is equal to the future value divided by the one plus. Present value multiplied by the discount rate is equal to the future value. Therefore, present value is nothing but the future value divided by the discount rate in time. And this discount rate is determined by the opportunity cost for an investor to actually use his money and put it elsewhere and get a return, which is going to forego by actually taking the decision of investing in your business. This is called the cost of capital. Cost of capital is nothing but an opportunity cost that the investor is making by taking a decision in investing in your business. There are sophisticated methods of actually de determining what the discount rate really is for a particular business and its profile of cash revenues and its profile of debt to equity financing. But that's outside of the scope of our discussion today. But just say if, consider that you know the discount rate is given as say 15%. This being reasonable expectation of investors in Indian market. In this case, the internal rate of return of this cash flow profile is 22%, which is far more in excess of 15%. And therefore, this is actually an investable business. There are other calculations that is possible based on the capital tables or the cap cost structure tables that uh, the business is sitting on. And that's again outside the scope of this discussion today. But save and accept all of this. We do know that this is a business that can give a very good return to shareholders. And therefore, it's valuable. Now comes to the question as to how do we value this business? Our standard business, which has got cash flow streams that can be determined very easily, is valued by discounted cash flow, which is actually the enterprise value, which is the PV of all of these cash flows, summated. The summation of all the 
present value of cash flows is equal to the value of the business. If you minus the debt value, then you come to the equity value. This is in rupees or dollar figures. If you divide it by the number of outstanding shares, those who are claiming their ownership rights jointly in onto the business, then you will get the value per share. This is called the intrinsic value per share, and in this case, it's calculated to be fourteen rupees. This is the DCF value. But how do startups which do not have a revenue profile, they don't have a single dollar or rupee of revenue, how do they value them? What is the practice? In order to answer this question, 